The Cretaceous period, the last period in the Age of Dinosaurs, was a time when all sorts of incredible and fearsome animals roamed the Earth. Large carnivorous dinosaurs ruled the land, enormous flying pterosaurs soared in the skies above, and extraordinary marine reptiles dwelled in the planet's oceans. But alongside these fascinating extinct groups, there were many kinds of more familiar animals, lineages that are still alive today and that are just as amazing. One of these groups of animals is the sharks, cartilaginous fish that were around long before the time of the dinosaurs too. During the Cretaceous period, sharks were widespread and abundant throughout the planet's oceans, just as they are today. They were adapted to fill all sorts of different niches too, with some sharks even feeding on dinosaurs, as we explored in our video on Critoxyrhina back in Shark Week 2020. Other Cretaceous sharks fed on very different things though. When you think of shark teeth, you might understandably at first picture sharp, pointed structures suited for piercing prey. However, there's a genus of shark called Tychodus that has some very strange looking teeth indeed, looking almost like pebbles with fascinating ripple-like structures running across the surfaces. Clearly, this shark was suited to a very specific feeding style, but what was it? Well, when the fossilized teeth of these sharks were first described and written about back in the 1700s, they were actually interpreted as the remains of pallets of fish, and so were considered to be the bony structures forming the roof and base of the mouth. Specifically, they were thought to be from porcupine fishes, and then later on during the 1800s, some other paleontologists continued to interpret them as fish pallets. These fossils were turning up all over the place too, from England and Germany to Alabama and Kansas, indicating that whatever sort of animal these were coming from probably had a global range. It was then in the 1830s that these fossils finally received an official scientific name. The genus was designated Tychodus, coming from the Greek four-folded tooth and very accurately describing the amazing ridges and patterns seen on these structures. There are many, many species that have been named within the Tychodus genus, potentially as many as 27 species, depending on who you ask, and the teeth all vary in different ways. Over the centuries since they were first written about, Tychodus teeth have been found in even more locations, including many other European countries, South America, Africa, India, Japan, Australia, and elsewhere. So going back to that question of what this animal was feeding on, why do these teeth look so strange? Well, when an animal becomes adapted to feeding on very hard prey, such as invertebrates with hard shells, a common evolutionary convergence that occurs among animals feeding on this sort of prey type is for the teeth to become very rounded and dome-shaped, as this shape is ideal for crunching through hard substances. This type of feeding, known as durophagy, is also seen in some mosasaurs, marine reptiles called placodonts, and in other kinds of fish, including many sharks and rays. So the Cretaceous shark Tychodus was definitely well suited to grinding down and crushing its prey, with those rounded pebble teeth making short work of Cretaceous animals with hard shells. In fact, studies of these teeth have shown them to be structurally quite complex, with three separate layers of enameloid present. These separate layers would then have stopped any cracks that might form in the teeth when crunching down on prey from spreading throughout the entire tooth, and the dome shape as well as the ridges across the surface are also involved in strengthening them. And they would need to have been strong, as it seems these sharks employed three-point bending stresses to crack open their prey, with these stresses occurring both at a large scale across the entire jaw, as well as at a smaller scale across the individual ridges of the teeth. But although it's very clear that Tychodus was well suited to feeding on hard-shelled prey items such as bivalves, there have also been some suggestions put forward that this is not all they were feeding on. As sharks are members of the chondrichthyans, the cartilaginous fishes, their skeletons generally do not fossilize well, being composed of cartilage and not bone, and so we are usually only left with fossil teeth from these fish. However, sometimes we do find more, and complete shark body fossils are known, though they are rare. In the case of Tychodus, some very nice complete jaws have been discovered in the past, and by looking at these, it's possible to get a sense of what this animal may have been like in life. Studying one such partial Tychodus jaw and skull fossil found in Nebraska, paleontologists found some interesting implications for the paleobiology of this shark genus. The arrangement of the teeth within the jaws was fairly elongate from front to back, and not very wide unlike in the modern-day myliobatid rays, known as eagle rays, which are very specialised in crushing particularly hard prey, but have very broad plates of teeth. This particular species of Tychodus, Tychodus occidentalis, also had relatively high crowned teeth, unlike the flat teeth of these rays. The paleontologists therefore took this, along with other lines of evidence, 
to suggest that Tychodus occidentalis might have been more of a generalist predator, and not a specialist on only hard prey. In fact, they also found that the upper and lower jaw teeth of this species had an interlocking mechanism that would have made them ideal for grasping too. So it seems that in some members of the Tychodus genus, the initial evolution of Durophagus teeth was later co-opted into other functions. A pretty cool example of how evolution works by modifying structures that are already there as they adapt to new functions. The researchers also pointed out that the exact shape and structure of the teeth and ridges vary quite a bit between different Tychodus species, and so presumably not every species was feeding on the exact same thing, with some perhaps being a bit more generalist, such as Tychodus occidentalis, while others may still have been specialists on a particular type of hard-shelled prey. Another benefit of finding varying types of Tychodus teeth is that it allows paleontologists to track their evolution. The question of what sort of shark Tychodus actually is has been the subject of debate ever since the teeth of this animal were first recognised as being from a shark, and some authors have in fact considered them to be a kind of ray, while others classified them as belonging to an extinct lineage of shark relatives, the hyperdonts. This classification as hyperdonts was generally accepted by many researchers for a long time, as various similarities in the teeth of Tychodus and hyperdonts appeared to support a close relationship. In 2015, an apparent intermediate form between Hyperdonts and Tychodus was even described, based on teeth found in Texas. These teeth showed a sort of missing link in their structure between a particular group of Hyperdonts and later Tychodus teeth, and so it was named as Paratychodus. However, more recent studies of the teeth and bones of the crushing shark have revealed something different, showing that Tychodus is actually a member of the Neosalachians, the name given to the grouping containing all living modern sharks and rays. This assertion is based on the composition of the teeth and the three layers of enameloid that I mentioned earlier, which is a feature only seen in Neosalachians. So perhaps Paratychodus is not a missing link after all, and just shows some similarities to the groups. Another contested part of Tychodus paleobiology concerns exactly how large the shark could grow. Well, an amazing discovery made in Spain and published on in 2020 might just answer this question, and as it turns out, some Tychodus species were pretty huge. Previous estimates of different Tychodus species have ranged all the way from 2 metres in total length all the way up to 14.4 metres. However, these are of course based on incomplete jaws and single or few vertebrae. And it's also important to remember that there are many different species of Tychodus that undoubtedly varied in their sizes. However, going back to that 2020 study, this paper documents the discovery of a series of articulated vertebrae all coming from the same individual, and based on calculations taking into account the dimensions of large modern sharks, they estimate a range of 4.3 to over 7 metres for this particular Tychoda specimen. A pretty sizeable fish then. Some other interesting insights were gained from the studies of these vertebrae too. By looking at the growth bands of the vertebrae, similar to looking at tree rings to see the age of the plant, the scientists were able to determine that Tychodus was quite a slow-growing shark, and that it matured relatively late in its life. Not only that, but by examining the radius of the initial birth ring, the researchers could tell that this Tychodus specimen would have had a total body length of between 65 centimetres and just over a metre when it was born. This is quite large for a baby shark, but it's consistent with the birth sizes of some modern sharks such as great hammerheads, tiger sharks, the great white, basking sharks and whale sharks, all of which are big bodied and are viviparous, meaning that they give birth to live young that are supported by a placenta inside the mother's body, or are oviviparous, meaning the shark babies hatch from eggs inside the mother and then live inside the womb and feed on an egg yolk sac for a period of time before coming out during a live birth. So the paleontologists infer that Tychodus, which seems to have given birth to babies significantly larger than those recorded from egg-laying or oviparous sharks, most likely reproduced by giving live birth, and put a lot of energy and resources into producing large and developed offspring. This then led the researchers to propose that Tychodus had K-selected traits, meaning they invested a lot into their young but only gave birth to a few babies. This contrasts with the condition in R-selected animals which produce many offspring that are generally less developed but grow faster. Based on the evidence presented in their paper, it does indeed seem likely that these fish were utilising the case selection strategy, and it's pretty amazing that this sort of paleobiological insight can be gained from just a few vertebrae. So Tychodus was a fascinating shark, 
These animals had some amazing adaptations that allowed them to survive and thrive in the highly competitive oceans of the Cretaceous world. And clearly they did amazingly, with so many different species arising over time. These were pretty large sharks too, and you certainly wouldn't want to have been a hard-shelled bivalve back in the Cretaceous oceans. And one of the coolest things about Tychodus is that you can go out there and find fossils of this shark yourself. If you're looking in rocks of the right formations, especially in the UK and US, but also elsewhere in the world, you might just be able to collect the distinctive rippled, pebble-like teeth of these sharks. As although they're quite rare fossils, sharks do have a lot of continuously replaced teeth and they do turn up in Cretaceous strata, such as in the chalk of the UK and the Niobrara formation of the US. Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed learning about Tychodus, the giant crusher of the Cretaceous. I hope you're enjoying Shark Week 2023 so far too. We've got some fantastic videos still to come, including an episode dedicated to the wonderfully bizarre goblin shark, a bonehead shark special, our fossil hunting trip to find some shark teeth of our own, and of course the Megalodon video to finish the week off with. This time looking at Megalodon's competition with the fearsome sperm whale Leviathan. Anyway, thank you for watching, and a big thank you to our Patreon supporters, especially our dinosaur tier supporters, Amanda von Nordek, Clara Middleton, Daniel Ingraham, Dhruv Srivastava, Gary Arrington, Giotist, Greg Silvernail, Corey Peterson, Loxipu, Mark Nevin, Mendicant Friar, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Persian Boy, Ralph Balzac, Robert Thomas, and Steve Bradshaw. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us. 